Welcome to Series 3, Episode 3 of the In Her Financial Shoes podcast. Welcome to the In Her Financial Shoes podcast with me, Catherine Morgan, founder of The Money Panel, helping you to get financially naked. Listen in each week where we talk about that taboo subject of money. Listen to brutally real life stories, step into our guest shoes and be left feeling 100% confident and in control. Oh, and we hate financial jargon, so don't expect any here. Small steps, big wins, let's go. Hi, and welcome to the podcast. Now, today's episode is going to be a little bit different to what I've brought to you before. And this particular episode was actually recorded live at Progressive Property, which is the home of Rob Moore and his business. And Rob Moore is my current mentor. I've been in his sales and marketing program now for almost six months. And a couple of months ago, Rob challenged me about doing more uh, video Now, I don't know about you, but I really struggle to look at myself and talk live on social media at the same time. It's something that I have to, like, I really, really have to focus on building my own confidence to actually look at myself on a live and talk at the same time. It's just, I just find it really, really difficult and a real challenge. Now, for those of you that know me well, will know that if anything is a challenge, then I will push myself out of my comfort zone. So I really pushed myself out of my comfort zone yesterday when I recorded this live episode um, at Rob Moore's um, offices. Now, we didn't just have one camera on us. We didn't have two. We didn't have three. We had six cameras on us. So <laughs> just to completely throw me off um, off out of my comfort zone. But it was a really great interview. And the reason that it was so important for me to do that not, wasn't just from a confidence perspective and kind of throw myself out of my comfort zone, but also because Rob has such it's such amazing insights to share with the world. And I love everything about what Rob believes in and have recently just finished actually his brand new book called I Am Worth More, which I would highly recommend that you go off and read this summer. The book for me really struck a chord for lots of different reasons. Um, I think primarily because when I work with women, the main block that a lot of us have in in building our businesses is around our own self-worth. I mean, whether you run your own business or not, really, your own self-worth is so, so important. So make sure you go and check out his new book, I Am Worth More. The other reason it resonated with me, actually, is from a personal perspective. Rob always talks very openly about the fact that he never felt worthy enough because he felt like he was never being noticed. And also he was badly bullied at school um, and had issues with uh, body confidence, which really, really resonated with my own personal story. And actually, whether that's what sort of drew me to Rob originally, it probably was. It was about his personal story really drew me in because I felt like I could really resonate with that. Now, I know that for many of you, the self-worth piece is huge and it's one of these things that's ever developing. You know, we always have to work on our own self-worth and particularly in business. One of the things I'm going to be talking about on next week's show is about how our own self-worth can actually hold us back in our own business, how we ourselves hold our own, you know, ourselves back in progressing our businesses. So I really hope you enjoy this particular episode. It's definitely one of my favourites to date. And if you would like to actually watch the video version of this, then please feel free to hop over to the website where you can jump on the link or go directly into Facebook under the money panel and you'll see it uh, fairly close to the top of the page. Hi, everybody. It's Catherine here. Um, So this is my biggest and best podcast and video that I have streamed so far on Facebook. So welcome. I thought you were going to say biggest and best guest then. Well, of course. I was going to be really flattered (laughs) and proud of myself. Well, that's what I meant, best video. Um, So I'm here with Rob. Rob Moore is my mentor. Um, I'm on Rob's Forex Mastermind Sales and Marketing Mastermind. So Rob, actually, you challenged me to do this because one of the things that I had been struggling with earlier in the year was to be visual on video Mm. and as much as I've tried to push myself out there on social media Rob said well come and come on my 
come on my podcast, uh, yeah. come on my Facebook page. So I'm accepting the dual challenge. Great. Yeah, I think um, social media is fantastic at the moment. I mean, we're living on your page, my page. We're living on the Disruptive Entrepreneur Community. We're recording on two cameras here for YouTube. It could be your YouTube channel, our YouTube channel. I mean, look at all the cool stuff you can do. We're in our, our studio. There's another camera there. I mean, we could live stream this on YouTube. We could live stream this on LinkedIn. The opportunities right now that they're on social media is really exciting. So well done for stepping up for the challenge. Um, someone's already made a comment about my beard going. I knew that was coming because I look about <laughs> 11. Um, but anyway, I'm all yours. Thank you. So in the we're in series three now on the podcast, and this is all very much focused about how to build a business. And a lot of my audience are female entrepreneurs or yet to be female entrepreneurs. So they're yet to be female. They're yet, no, they are right. definitely female. <laughs> but they are perhaps in that stage where they're stuck in a nine to five job and they're looking to make that transition, which is where I was you know, not that long ago, okay. 2016. So I really wanted to focus on interviewing you, Rob, around some of the challenges that you've had in building your business, mm -hmm. personal challenges and business challenges, and just to share some of the successes and things that you've been teaching me okay. in the mastermind um, to help those ladies to step into their shoes and help them with th some of the things that you can pass on to help them. Sure. But the first thing I actually wanted to ask you was I've just come back from holiday, hence why I look a bit orange. And I've just finished reading your, well, I've actually listened to the audio version, but I also have the book here, I'm Worth More. And I absolutely loved this book. Thank you. For several reasons, mainly because um, I resonated with quite a lot of your story. And I wanted to just go back to one of the earlier chapters in your book about your hero growing up, which mm. was... Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, one of them. My dad as well. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and ditto for me, my dad played a really important part in my life growing up. And um, my biggest influence when I was growing up was uh, Rocky. Okay. The, the Rocky songs and, yeah. you know, kind of... So I felt a lot of synergies in there. But I mm. think the, the concept of the book around focusing on your self-worth, I think, is hugely important when it comes to money. Because actually our early relationship with money has a huge impact on how we behave with money. Mm, sure. So I just wanted to ask you really, what was your earliest experience growing up around money? I can remember this clear as day. Um, so my dad always used to have his money in his right hand pocket, side pocket. Um, and back then... A, because I was small, and B, money was bigger. Remember the old brown £10 notes? I don't, I don't think there was £20 denominations <laughs> back in the like early 1980s, but there was massive, the old brown £10 notes and the big £5 notes. And he used to have this big watch of cash, and he used to go around to pubs, uh, auction houses, liquidation sales, and he would buy stock for his pubs, restaurants, bars, hotels. It was all in cash. I'd ask him for money, and he'd often give me a little bit of money here and there. Um, he'd all, usually make me work for it. And um, my first job was bottling up in his pub. Mm. So bottling up was going down to the cellar. Now the cellar was behind the bar, but a straight drop down. So it's actually quite dangerous, but I, I loved that. Um, and I just used to go down into the cellar and bring all the crates of um, bottles up. When they were heavy for a kid, I was probably only six. He got me working really young. I mean, that'd be illegal now. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I'd, I'd like load up all these crates, carry them up this re almost vertical flight of stairs in a cellar bottle up I had to like always put the um, oldest bottles at the front and the newest bottles at the back so it didn't go out of date um, and in the fridge rotate them so that the cold ones were at the front and um, back then you know you get coke out of the um, like pump well, back then, it's a mixer now so it's syrup which mixes with soda but back then we literally opened two litre bottles of coke and poured it into this massive canister and then it would vacuum seal shut and that would come through. And it would take me like an hour to fill these things up and I'd do that and I'd do change all the beer kegs and everything. I was doing this at six. I absolutely loved it. I felt like the right Don. Um, my dad would pay me about a pound a week to do that. Um, I'd also, I'd probably end up earning maybe five or six quid because I'd, I'd, I'd earn the pound a week for doing that. 
but and one of the carpets in the disco room. My dad had uh, one of his um, hotel, one of his pubs had like four different bar areas, and one of them was like a disco area. And the carpet was pretty much the same colour as a pound coin. So if you dropped a pound coin, you were screwed. You couldn't find it. <laughs> and me and my sister used to go and get like get, always find a few quid after like a busy Friday night or Saturday night or Sunday night. And I'd take all that money down to the local pound shop and I'd either buy airfix airplanes um, or I'd buy pictures of Ferraris, Lamborghinis and stuff and I'd put them all over my wall. And that's my first ex- first experience of money at six years old, properly working for money. And I think that's where a lot of my relationship with money came from. And so your dad rewarded you by giving you money for the work that you did? Yeah, doing. I mean, he made me work hard for not a lot of money. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he did. I mean, every, dad, dad would give me stuff. He was very generous, still is. Mm. Um, but yeah, he wanted to teach me that you didn't get much. He wanted to teach me, I think, that, you know, you, you work hard, you get reward. But also, it's all right to ask every now and again. Because dad, my, my dad, dad's favourite saying is, if you don't ask... You don't get. get. So it's not like he'd never give me money if I asked. He would often not. But sometimes I think if he thought I asked well or I pitched good or, you know, he thought, yeah, this is for a good thing, he'd give me money instead of making me work for it. Mm. Um, And I don't know how strategic that was if that was accidental, but I have no problems with asking for money and I have no problems with asking for things. And I I have a little bit of cheek, I suppose, or I'm quite um, direct. Maybe um, some would regard maybe a bit cheeky and audacious around asking for things and I think that's because that was ultimately what how my dad raised me and and that's how I want to raise my kids. I was just going to ask you actually how does that influence on how you how do you teach your children about money because you've got two children haven't you? Yeah so I want to instill in my children the um, work reward ratio Um, so if you apply yourself to something there will be a reward Because I believe that's how society works, whether it's a salary or you sell to a client or a customer or you, you you know, you get a retainer or whatever. So if I feel like my kids have done worthy work, I'll reward them. I also give them good prizes if they win things. Mm. So if they play golf and they do well or they try hard or they overcome a big challenge, there'll be a prize. And that prize, I'll usually be quite generous with that because I want to teach them that, you know, if if they train hard and practice hard and they win something, the world's going to get rewarded. Um, And I rarely, if ever, just give them stuff. Mm. But I also, at some point, want to also teach them that it's not just hard work that equals money. Because, you know, there's plenty of people that work really hard and they earn minimum wage. So it's actually not the case that the world rewards just hard work. The world rewards attention. The world rewards reach. The world rewards impact. The world rewards smart work and leverage as well as hard work. And they're things that I'm going to have to introduce into teaching my kids. But they're still quite young, so this time. And do you think you teach kids different things at different ages? Oh, 100%. People are always asking me. Um, I put my water down there. I'm serious about this. One. <laughs> um, people are always saying to me I should write a book for um, children on money, and I'd love to, except mm. a 16-year-old and a 6-year-old is a completely different thing that you're teaching them. Mm. I mean, I taught my son to count with golf balls and pound coins um, from probably the age of well, not even two. Uh, and my son knew what a Kruger round was before his teachers knew what a Kruger round was because he was winning them when he was getting hole in ones. He's had, he's had um, six, no, eight little bastard. He's wow. had eight hole in ones. So there's, uh, Kruger rounds are worth 950 quid ish now at the moment, something Gosh. like that. <laughs> I know. And he's like, Where are my Kruger <laughs> rounds? You owe me Kruger rounds. And like, um, so I wanted to introduce him to counting with money. Mm. And we, we travel a lot around the world as well. So I also wanted to um, get him counting in um, dirhams, mm. in euros, in US dollars, in Cayman dollars, etc. Um, and he does that as well. Um, so, but, but the whole subject around teaching about money, I think it's vital that young people are taught money. But I feel like from zero to maybe five or six, it's a phase. And you've got to teach them to count. Mm. And then, you know, maybe six to, I don't know, eight, nine, ten. I think there's different stages. Um, and it, as such, that's hard to write into one book. That might be a series of books. Do you think, have you seen the recent Monopoly launch in this digital version? So you play the Monopoly game, but with digital money rather than physical pounds? Yeah, we've got it. Ah. What? Yeah, we play it where you actually, I mean, you have a card. Not um, not coins. Not or coins, notes. and you put the card into the machine and you charge the card. It's great. I got my kids playing that um, years ago um, when that came out because I thought that that was a great way of teaching them how money works, works in a modern way and mm. um, where money comes from. 
I mean, it's funny, I'm, Connor's just put here, Connor's, um, he's a lovely man, and he always, like, he gives me some good banter on social media. And he's put, um, I don't know if we can swear in your podcast, so I won't say it, but FFS, work equals reward, it's all well and good with adults. But with kids, should have it easier, just bung them a few quid and stop being tight. <laughs> um, well, I, I, when there are times that you can be generous, birthdays, Christmases, occasions I like to be generous Mm. um, but everything else I do like them to I want to teach my kids what the world is like and I don't think the kids the world just bungs kids um, you know a, a, a bit of money or a reward just for being um, and I get because you know we love our kids um, but I'm, I want to be aware. I want my kids to under, to experience the world as it is, not as I see it mm. per se. So we're often as I'm not a parenting guru here, by the way, I'm still figuring it out because my kids are eight and four. But a few things I think I have figured out is um, we often parent in the way we feel is best for our parents. Now, I know that um, best to parent. Now, I know that sounds obvious, but what we do with that, therefore, is we shield them from things we didn't like. And we expose them to things we didn't have or we wanted or we had and we liked. So what we're doing is we're giving them our experience Mm. of being parented filtered through our perception of how parenting should be. Mm. That's actually biased. And then here's the interesting thing. Then you've got your wife or your husband doing exactly the same thing, but through their Their own filters and their values and their childhood. Um, uh, but I want to show my kids what the world is really like, which is why from time to time, if I lose my rag with them, that's okay. From time to time, if I push them a little bit hard, that's okay. And from time to time, if I rescue them and help them out, that's okay too. Um, because the best way to prepare them to be successful in the world is to show them what the world is really like before they get out there. Mm. And the world is all those things. It's a paradoxical balance of all those things. One of my mentors, John Martini, said to me, nothing that you do um, is a disservice to your children. Um, and he was telling me that when I felt I was feeling quite a lot of guilt because I'd lost my shit with my son. Um, he was just pushing me. I was, you know, he was pushing me. I mean, I, As kids do, right? Yeah, they do. But sometimes we're having a bad day and sometimes it's us being sure. But other times they do just push us and, and we lose our shit and that's okay. Um, and he was just really pushing me. Um, and we were quite near a road and he was messing about. So I pushed him away from the road. Mm. But I pushed him like, you know, like you're going to feel this. I pushed him harder than I should have. And he had his sort of golf bag on him and he all fell to the back and his legs went in the air. And, <laughs> you know, he looked, you know, I felt he cried and I immediately felt like the worst dad in the world. <laughs> Um, and I picked him up in quite an angry way. I was dumped him in the back of the car, I sat in the front of the car, like we were in silence for about, you know, five minutes while he was crying. Um, and then I went on to my phone and got Audible out and downloaded every single parent book I'd never read and got them on Audible, and then the next week I listened to them all. Any good ones? Um, yeah, I mean, look, the Steve Biddulph book, books are good. Um, Karma, I think it's called a Karma Happier Kids is good. I'm, I have to get my phone out. We're living on it at the moment, but I've got quite a few. But the, but the point I'm making here is I would not have gone and downloaded all those parenting books and learned better strategies had I not lost my shit with Bobby and then mm. felt guilty. And the guilt drove me to do that. Mm. Also, Bobby found my boundary. And so then he, because kids are always trying to find your boundary. And he found my boundary. And, um, you, you know, if you push your kids a bit hard, then it teaches them to be independent, which is a great gift to them. Um, but it's just worth mentioning that John DeMartini said, nothing that you do does not serve your kids in some way. So that you don't beat yourself up about all the shit you do as a parent. Because I, you know, I think a lot of parents beat themselves up um, about not being a perfect parent. And um, let's be honest, every day you don't punch your kids in the face, that's a good day. You should go to bed <laughs> going, do you know what? I had a good day today. I did not punch my kid in the face. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were just chatting off, off air, weren't we? I was just back from holiday and it was a lovely time, but it's not really a holiday for you as a parent, is it? No. Because you're, you know, you're looking after the kids. Mm. So, And one of the things you just mentioned there, Rob, about is that you would you try and shelter your children away or against things that happened to you in the past or things that you grew up Yeah, about. my son's not going to boarding school because I've got the worst, the worst pain and memory of boarding school. Showers. Yeah. 
Why fronts? I'm not even going to go <laughs> any further. Honestly, my son is but like, yeah, but we do that, don't we? The stuff we hated growing up, we want to shield our parents, my, our kids from there. But actually, if I'm looking at it in a more balanced way, I might dad sent me to rugby camp, and I, I hated it. And I was talking to Jake Wood about this because um, he's just recently sent his um, daughter to boarding school, and she's off on a camp at the moment. And I thought I hated that camp. And my natural instinct wants me to not send my kids to that camp because I hated it. But I thought, yeah. actually, every kid should go to a camp they, ha- they hate for a week. Every kid. That's part of growing up. Like, I remember I did Duke of Edinburgh and we were, like, staying out in the pissing rain all weekend, having to put up a tent we couldn't put up. It took hours. I hated that. And I thought, I'm not putting my kids through that. No, every kid has got to sleep in a tent that yeah. they haven't put up properly, in the rough, pissing down with rain um, for one weekend. Well, you've got to go through all this stuff. It's character building. So this is what I'm trying to balance. The yeah. things that... I hate it that I'm trying to protect my kids from. Actually, some of it I've got to expose them to. Mm. And what, so what things, looking back at your childhood, would you say were your biggest lessons? What, what taught you the most growing up from when you... Because, I mean, in your book, you talk about a lot about the episodes of bullying that you had at school. Was that the biggest lesson for you growing up, do you think? Oh, I mean, I mean that's a huge question, isn't it? Is it? Do you mean in any specific area? Well, I think... Like you, I think lessons, we go through lessons in life to learn something. There's always a positive of every single experience. Yeah, but I never saw that as a kid. You know, I didn't, I I didn't know that, Mm. that there was always a positive. I was, I thought that life happened to you, not for you. And I felt like I wasn't in control of, okay, I try hard and put effort into exams or whatever. But a lot of things in my life, like my weight and, um, you know, how people felt about me and, and maybe the things I wasn't good at, I just assume, well, that this is me, this is who I am, I'm not good at this stuff, I'm never going to be good at that, this stuff. So I don't, like now I like to get a lesson out of everything mm. because I maybe am a bit more experienced. But back then I, I don't think I saw a lot of the lessons. So it would be looking back going, what did I learn the most? I mean, I learned a lot from my dad about business and money and um, I learned a lot about my, from, from my mum about compassion and patience. I'm not the most patient person my mum really is. Um, and I've had to learn that. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I learned a lot about myself through having, I think most people have got a story, haven't they, of things in their childhood that made them feel vulnerable, weak, rejected. The fact is I was a, a really fat kid and that was mine. Um, and I, what have I learned from that is that um, I'm worthy of love, attention, praise, in, a feeling of importance, being noticed and respected, unworthy of that just as much as anybody else. And it's okay to seek that in the ways that I want to seek that. Mm. Whether that's through my fans and followers, the books I write, the interviews and the podcasts I do, it's okay to get that need met. Whereas I always used to feel guilty and like there was something wrong with me because I wanted to be noticed and liked by people. But every human being has a need to be loved. Every human being wants to be liked, respected and admired for what they do Mm. in your own way. Uh, and I guess I learned that that was OK. And I, I found that now in for the last sort of, 10 years, at least I get that, get that need, back, need met through books, podcasts. I guess the people that I um, help inspire, educate, influence, whatever words you want to put on it. Um, some of the nice material items and things that I'm lucky to have. I think that certainly meets a little bit of that need. Um, but, but I've also learned that every day that need needs to be remet again. Um, and is it a constant yeah. journey? Is is this discovery of self worth? I and mean, did you have a pivotal moment where you realised actually I am worth more, or was this like a leading? Yeah, you know, was this a journey of discovery? There was definitely no day when I woke up and went, finally, I'm worth more. I know yeah. what it is that yeah. <clears throat> there wasn't for me. <clears throat> I mean, I've had some moments like when my dad had his big nervous breakdown on December the fifteenth, two thousand five. I mean, that was a lightning bolt for me. I think it's a progressive, it's a mix of doing a lot of personal development, reading a lot of personal development books, podcasts, going on a lot of personal development courses, you know, understanding myself, self-awareness, understanding about mindset psychology. I think, you know, looking inwards and valuing what I've already done and who I already am and what I've already got to offer and that I'm unique and that I have got talents and that I have got control of my outcomes in my life and that I can learn things that I didn't think I could learn. And that was, that's been, been an ongoing journey, which for me never stops. So there's that part. And then there's also the 
progressive um, experience and results. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have one property, 10 properties, 50 properties or 100 properties, that, that's going to impact your feeling of worth. Um, and if you have 100 properties, you're going to feel like you're more worth more than if you have one. So as I've written more books and bought more properties and made more money and become a millionaire between the age of 30 and 31 and then a decamillionaire a few years later. And, you know, as all of that stuff, you check off the list, you break the world records like I have, you write the books that I have that have got to number one and, and all these things. It, that, that just naturally increases your self-worth. And to a certain degree, it gives you these pillars or this big foundational rock that can't be infiltrated. Mm. But that doesn't mean you're immune because something can happen to humbleize you very quickly. Um, and, you know, I'm still quite susceptible to things happening and me feeling like that kid again or feeling like, oh, actually, I'm not, I'm not really that good and I've got so much work to do. So I do think it's a journey. And a lot of people think that's a bad thing. They're like, well, you know, when are you ever going to be happy? When are you ever going to be satisfied? When are you ever going to retire? When are you ever going to be made? Mm. When is it ever going to be enough? Well, that is not the journey of evolution. Evolution never gets to the point where it's like, okay, well, we've ev evolved to our maximum capacity. It doesn't. It's continual. So is the journey of self-discovery. So is the journey of wealth accumulation. So is the journey of, you know, what gets you up in the morning. A lot of people are looking for this retirement day, you know, in, in business and money. And I think it's an illusion because for me, then retirement means atrophy. It means boredom. I want to know that there's something, a new challenge tomorrow. And of course, there's part of me that doesn't want to know that as well, because part of me wants it to be easy, because that's also the human paradoxical nature. We love the challenge and the growth, but we also secretly want it to be really easy. It's really interesting. I, I'm a, I talk about this regularly on the podcast. I hate the word pensions because as soon as someone mentions the word pension, people think of old, being old, you know, buying an annuity and all of these things. And it, it's depressing and people don't want to think about it. So they just don't think about it and bury their heads in the sand. And I think you're absolutely right. Retirement isn't about finishing work, sitting in your slippers, playing golf. You know, it's, it is this progressive journey, isn't mm. it? So I guess that leads on to one of my next questions in that, a lot of women that listen to the podcast are stuck in this kind of transition world where they may be in a nine to five job or they're maybe starting their business, but they're kind of at this crossroads roads where they're a little bit lost and they're thinking, I want to build income. I want to build wealth. You know, I, I'm reading some of these books. I'm maybe listening to some of the podcast where, how do they know what's their next step to discover who they are and what they should be doing in, in the world to make money and to grow. Okay. So I think the first thing you've got to do is you've got to think about what are you excited about? What are you passionate about? What makes you feel alive? And what could you see yourself doing as a potential career beyond your employment? And I think now it is actually easier than ever to pick something that's a, a passion profession merge you know, uh, a hobby as well as a business because of internet, social media. Mm. Um, a, a, a 16 year old kid just won $3 million in a gaming competition, you know, console. Mm. And I like to use that as an analogy that kids now can monetize playing computer games. Uh, and, you know, kids can monetize YouTube channels. There's that Ryan's young lad who's seven now, I believe. He's got Ryan's Toys Reviews that did 18 million in revenue last year, dollars, $18 million. So it's a great time to monetize your passion because a lot of people are going into something just for the money. Now, I'm also not one of those people that says, oh, I'd never do it for the money. I just don't believe people when they say it's not about the money. I'm sorry, part of it has to be about the money because mm. it's not about the money. Either give it all away or don't ever charge. So mm. there's got to be that symbiosis of passion profession. Uh, so you've got to figure out what the business model is and what your passion is. Now, the problem with that is for some people, they perceive that they don't know what that is or that that could take a long time or whatever. So I like to go into testing mode and think, well, OK, what could I try that I might like? I, I tried various martial arts for a few years. I mean, I wasn't trying to be a professional at them, but I tried them. I thought, well, I'm going to try. <laughs> move away. Uh, yeah, a long time ago. Um, but so I tried China. I tried Qigong. I tried traditional kickboxing. I tried karate. I tried taekwondo a bit. Um, why not? Try them all. I can try them all. I was in my mid-20s. I had a lot of spare time because I was an artist. And that's how it can be with your part-time 
um, profession. You could try training in, you could set up a, a podcast on what you're interested in. You could try um, setting up an online course, or you could go and do some extracurricular study on uh, getting some qualifications and try stuff. Um, obviously, you want to think about what do I think I could be the most interested in. Um, and then you want to start doing it part time, evenings, weekends, you know, like when the kids are asleep in the afternoon or between school runs or where, whenever else. You could probably on an hour a day, you could probably get a, a bit of momentum going. Obviously, full time, you've got more momentum, but you start where you start. And then when you sort of think, yeah, OK, I'm finding something here that I'm really into some products you're selling on an e-commerce site or you're doing um, rent to rent in property investing or whatever. You, um, you're setting up a little training course that you're doing in the thing that you're really good at that you didn't really think you could have a business. But actually, you are good at it and people want to pay for it. Um, and then what you do is you set an income goal sometime in the future whereby um, you can replace and leave your current job. So you've got to work out, do I want to replace all my income or do I just want to replace the overhead part? Because I, it, the, the less you like your job, you should just replace the overhead part and then get rid of it. And OK, you're going to be tight for a bit, but you've got your big expenses covered because quality of life is really important. I'm not the sort of person that just says sack your boss. I'm not into all this sack your boss, sack your boss, sack your boss all the time. One, because I've got 86 staff around the place. So that'd be a, fucking, uh, it's a very stupid thing to say. Um, but also, um, one, I think a lot of people want to develop towards running their own business in, say, five years or 10 years. I take the risk hiring everyone. I, the entrepreneur takes the risk. I'm taking the risk for everyone here. They're going to get, they all get paid before me. Um, but so, you know, yeah, you might like being an entrepreneur. Um, so I've got quite a lot of guys who work here, I think, are more entrepreneurs. They have autonomy and choice and freedom and input. But of course, I take the risk and their, their exchange is that they get a salary. Um, but that could be a risk. If you just sack your boss now, you've got mortgages, school fees and everything else. Um, so I'm a fan of you trying it on the side to see if you really like it. Mm. Because you might actually find after two years of doing a part time job, I don't like it. Yeah. Because it is definitely not for everyone. In fact, it's not for most of the population, let's be honest. Um, do, you, do you believe that everybody has it in them to be a successful entrepreneur? I think anybody can be, but not everyone will or not everyone wants to be. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I think every human being has latent within them the capacity to be everything that every human being could be, taking aside genetic advantage. So, if some people are very physically strong or very physically tall or very physically short um, or very, you know, blah, 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 that's going to give them genetic advantage in certain disciplines. But I'll give you an example. Here. Connor, Connor is a watchmaker. So no one has a genetic advantage when they're born to be a watchmaker. What Connor does is learnable. Mm. And he's learned from some, you know, very, very wealthy watchmakers. So in, in property, in watches, in running a podcast, in being an influencer, in marketing, in making iPhones. We are all levelly equal when we're born. It's a question of, one, what are you surrounded by in your environment to programme your mind? So, you know, if, you, if your grandfather was a watchmaker and your father was a watchmaker and you just had that from a young age, it's not genetics, it's just your environment. Mm. Um, and then also, you know, what do you want to do? So do I believe everybody has it within them, the capacity to be an entrepreneur? Yes. What's an entrepreneur? Someone who takes risk in the hope of profit. Well, everybody on the planet's got that within them. It's just a question of, is, is it what they want? Um, and, you know, are, have they got the, have they found the model and... But, but yeah, every human being. And then commercialising it. Yeah, of course. And then there's the element of can you, can you stomach the risk? And um, can you handle learning about sales and marketing? Because any entrepreneur, when they start, oh, yes, I'm going to make fancy water bottles and I'm going to put the disruptive entrepreneur branding on them. That's my business model. That sounds like fun. Oh, I'll just go and buy a load of bottles and print them. This is my, the fun part, designing them. Then you've got to go and sell them and take a load of rejection. And then you've got to go and generate a load of leads where you're maybe not converting them or you're paying too much for a cost per lead. So there's all the business elements of it. Now you get protected from a lot of that when you're an employee. 
you know, none of the staff have to pay all of our um, invoices, Mark and I do. They don't have to deal with any legal cases, Mark and I do. They don't have to deal with any reputational issues, Mark and I do. It's a completely um, different mindset. It is, and it's, and it's not right or wrong. And I'm not saying, you know, like I, there's the employee, the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur, and we all have an equal role and we all equally serve each other. The reason the entrepreneurs at the top get paid well if they're successful is because we take the bigger risk. It's simply risk reward. And do you think there's a, a different risks that women take in business versus men? Without this being kind of a gender thing, oh, I guess it is. I was it waiting is a gender for that question. One. Oh. But the reason I ask, right, is that so being in your Forex Mastermind program, okay, so the way I run my business is, oh. is nine till three, I'm in 100% entrepreneur's mode. Do you then, want the politically correct well, answer or do you want what I really no, think? No, I want about what this? you really think. I don't think that women should ever use it as an excuse that they're a woman. And I don't think they need to hear people like me saying it's harder. Um, because I don't think that serves. Mm. It's situationally different. Yes. yes. So um, if you've got less time, fine. What do you have to be to have your Darwinian advantage more leveraged? You have to get yourself a VA. You know, you have to. I can definitely waste a few hours a day. Uh, and actually, if I'm going to be stereotypical, uh, most women I meet are more organised and are more efficient. So I'm going to be positively stereotypical. <laughs> we, we have more women in the office than men. Um, generally more loyal and generally will take less risk. That's our experience. I'm not saying for the, the wide... And by the way, my MD says that and she's a woman, so that's from her, not me. Mm. But she thinks that's the general consensus. Um, so it's situationally different. If you have to look after your kids and if you have to do the school run, you just have to figure that out. Yeah. Um, and you have to get in what you can get in when you can get it. And you have to set up your life to enable you to do that. So give yourself a business model where you can work from home and get yourself on a laptop and your phone all synced so that, you know, if you're waiting 15, 20 minutes before the kids come in from school, you can do a bit of cheeky social media or you can go and do an inventory check or go and list some stuff on EBR or whatever. You have to do what you can do. It's situationally different. Um, I mean, look, the world is changing as well, isn't there, where there are now men that are much more house able and the roles are more joint now. Um, but I'm not falling for that trap of answering that question in that way. <laughs> no, no. Is, is it harder? It wasn't a trick question. Um, <laughs> I think it's different, and I, I think you should just own how your life is and figure it out, because there are a lot of very successful mm. mum entrepreneurs mm. in my communities, fiercely successful, and they're juggling the kids between... I, I know um, parents who've got um, two kids... Uh, they're split with their partner. They're juggling between they have the kids full time. The partner has the kids full time. They're buying dozens of properties. You know, they're traveling all up and down the country doing all of our events and they're making it happen. And there's plenty of, of those doing really well. And of course, there's plenty struggling as well. Um, yeah. yeah, I think what you were just saying about like leveraging and one of the first books I read when, when I joined your mastermind was Life Leveraging. And I leveraged way too late and I knew I should have done it much sooner but I think as a, as a mum I have to leverage probably more because I don't have as much time in the day I might have more time in the evening the kids are in bed but my day just looks slightly different that's yeah. all it is it's just it's how you manage your time and how you leverage and outsource mm. and the, cause the world at the moment as well is not nine to five anymore so it might have yeah. been harder if you've if you're looking for your kid after your kids all the way through working hours that's hard mm. um, but now you can work evenings you can work in the middle of the day you can work at five o'clock in the morning it, it, the world is different. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And oh, by the way, it's a great time to be a woman. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I probably at, shouldn't at tell you At five o'clock, good time or... Uh... Yeah, 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 it's great. <laughs> five o'clock's the perfect time to be a woman. Um, so um, I did a sort of semi-casting for a TV show um, for a production company just recently. And we were talking through some concepts. And he said, well, the only one thing I've got to say, Rob, this bit of a problem is mm, TV doesn't really like white men at the moment. Mm, not really in... You know, I was like, all oh, right, women, really, women, really popular at the moment. You know, if you're a woman, is this why you got rid of the beard? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so like, for the history of the world ever, it's like the biggest gift to be a white male. And now, just at the time when I'm coming into my prime and getting my massive reach, TV doesn't want white men anymore. Yeah. Have you noticed on BBC Sport? You know, the, the, you look at that, and the, the women's sport is equal to the men's sport. That the, the it's a really good time to be a woman in society, probably the best time in terms of the equality balance and, the, you know, the ability to be career focused. And, you know, some seriously big hitting career women, you know, like Sheryl Sandberg, uh, Oprah Winfrey, uh, um, Michelle Obama, you know, like Ariana Huffington. Um, and they're killing it. 
mm. making loads of money, really successful, and they're mums too. Yes, so absolutely. So I just wouldn't want anyone to become a victim and use it as an excuse. Yeah. And just to finish on that then, in terms of who inspires you, you've mentioned a few female entrepreneurs there, but who inspires you in business? I mean, look, anyone who takes the risk and sets up their own business inspires me. Um, I, I love studying successful entrepreneurs. I don't really mind who it is. I love Arnie. Uh, I loved Steve Jobs was a fascinating case study from his upsides and downsides. Mm-hmm. I studied all the big businessmen from the 80s and 90s like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and you know, Jeff Bezos, of course, and Elon Musk is an interesting character. A- Alexander McQueen, I think, is a really honest um, and I just think his story is so amazing. Um, and you've just got to watch his documentary. I can't even put it into words. I love watching about fashion designers and how they merge the creative with the um, commercial elements. Um, so I know that wasn't like, I don't have one hero, really. Arnold Schwarzenegger, if I had to say one. Alexander McQueen, yeah, quite, but quite a sad story, really. That's why, it's, why it's such a great documentary, because mm. it's raw and emotional, and it, 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 I think it really depicts the commercial and artistic struggle um, better than any, any documentary I've ever seen. Yeah, mm. yeah fantastic. Mm. And so one final question then, um, just a little bit of a fun question. Um, so can you share something with us that you've not shared before? or an interesting fact for my audience? Okay, so when I was an artist, I was trying to get myself out there more and I was trying to be a bit provocative because I figured I'm a Peterborough guy and I'm not doing that well at art. I've got to make some noise. Um, And so I was quite into poetry at the time and I was writing some pretty weird poetry because I was in a pretty weird place when I was an artist, listening to German heavy metal, painting through the night. I was... So I, I wrote this little ode to cats, but it was about all the things that annoyed me about them and how I'd like to, you know, like... <laughs> I, thought, I don't like cats. So basically it was all the different ways you could kill a cat. Um, it was supposed to be tongue-in-cheek. And I, like, I am um, on the front of my house, which was all like a, a, a sort of a cream render, and all the way down the side that was brick. On the front cream render, I... I, I um, wrote in, I wrote the poem in brick colour and then down the brick I wrote it in white like graffiti paint and it was all on the front and the side of the house all of these different ways to kill a cat you know, <laughs> gouge out his eyes and carve his head and parade ladies. its head around on spears and all sorts of stuff <laughs> um, and it went wild in Peterborough everyone was talking about it I got slaps in the face from women when I used to go out into town I got drinks thrown over me <laughs> Um, I was in the local paper every week. Were people writing in every week. One woman wrote in and said she saw me hiding in my bushes with a gun shooting at cats, which, of course, <laughs> I never did. It was, it, it was supposed to be irony. Everyone knew I had a cat. Um, and, and then they, um, the council got all over me. They tried to, like, you know, tried to get me to take it down. My dad's brewery pub got, wrote me a load of letters saying it was affecting the pub business. And the, the whole of Peter returned on me. But a load of people were like, this is art and this is great and it's provocative and it's, it's his house, he can do what he wants. He's made a statement, doesn't need planning permission, it's his house. Um, and, yeah, that, that went on for like a year. And in the end, I kind of bottled it and painted over it because well, I didn't want my dad to lose his pub, for one. Um, but I just didn't really like all the negative attention. Retrospectively, that was the best piece of art I ever did. Uh, and that could have really catapulted my career, but I kind of hid away from it. Mm-hmm. Still to this day in the council, they use that as a precedent case study for planning law. Um, so there's still a little <laughs> bit of me left in the Peterborough Council. I, and I won um, face of Peterborough 1999 modelling competition. Did you? There you go. Yeah, yeah, that's embarrassing, isn't it? Um, <laughs> there you go. There's two stupid things you didn't know about me that now you do. And how are you going to sort out your car situation? I Thanks have to ask for bringing question. that up in front of everyone. <laughs> um, it's got to be a Ford Fiesta, right? Most reliable car on the planet. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could do that to myself. <laughs> so, yeah, so I have a Lamborghini Aventador which broke down and I was six and a half hours stuck in the middle of the road. That's currently in a specialist um, in Bedfordshire getting repaired as we was speak. Was this because of the rain? Um, I see, I didn't make the last mastermind because I was on holiday and I yeah, heard I that the, the rain roof. pelted down I and Rob the, was like... Yeah, I left the roof, <gasps> off. Left I left the roof, the roof off and that could have contributed to the breakdown. <laughs> we, we will wait for the diagnosis. Um, my, I have a Panamera Turbo Porsche uh, and that's in for a service and three or four faults. Um, 
my the Range Rover, the engine blew up, the one that my wife drives, and that's I need a whole new engine. And then, so my runaround was my Ferrari Testarossa 1987. Your runaround, love it. And um, I was in the drive-thru at 5.30 in the morning and it was all screechy, so I turned it off and then it just wouldn't start. So I had to push so it, push it around the corner. I got a taxi. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Mark, my business partner, Mark, was saying to me, less is more, less is more, Rob, less is more. <laughs> And actually getting in a taxi and just doing a little bit of work on your phone in the back, it was yeah, quite cathartic. Yeah, I could be a, I could be one of these, like, what do they call them, vagabonders who just live in Airbnbs and just travel and don't it's have rent. any possessions. Yeah. Minimalist. No, I couldn't. I could do it for about a week. And then I'm like, I need my Lamborghini Aventador. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's been a humbling week. £600,000 worth of cars and none of them work. Yikes. Yeah. Yikes. Thanks for bringing that up live to everyone. You're welcome. Well, about, this isn't to. about money. This isn't about being in her shoes. <laughs> What's this got to do with her shoes? Hmm? Well, in- interestingly, actually, one of the things, because my dad was an entre- is an entrepreneur and he loved his cars. And so he had, what did he have? When he, we had, he had a Jag when we were growing up. I remember this one day where we all, all four of us were crammed in the back. This is the day before you didn't have to have yeah, seatbelts yeah. on each person. And we bought this huge, great big plant from the garden centre. And we had to try and get this plant in the back of the car through yeah. the sunroof at the same time as us. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we grew up with that. But actually, for me, that, that taught me quite a lot of messages about money because I was taught that it was all about status and stuff. And so I spent most of my 20s buying stuff because mm. that's how I thought I would be happy. But I guess with cars, stuff there's an element happy of though. happiness. Yeah, yeah. Like, can I just, let's have this debate because I think it's a good debate. So a lot of people say that money doesn't make you happy. I don't agree with that. I think that money in and of itself doesn't make you happy. But what money is, is an enabler, a fuel, an exaggerator, an accelerator. And also money is the universal exchange of value in which we've decided democratically across the world to measure value and worth. So, you know, people want freedom and time and fulfillment and all these other things that make them happy. Well, money enables that. If you want freedom, you want to travel the world. Money enables you to travel around the world. But then a lot of people go to another level and say, well, you know what? OK, yeah, I get that. But actually, it's about experiences and not materialism. Material, you know, materialism is evil. But um, I've, to me, experiences are as material as materialist, as materialism. And material is as spiritual as many things that are spiritual. So let's say, for example, you, you like experiences. So you want to go to, um, you know, one of the most beautiful locations in the world and you want to be treated like a prince or a princess, um, you know, and you want lovely spas and you want a bit, you, you know, you want, yeah, you want really nice food <laughs> and that kind of thing. So these are all experiences. You want to see amazing places. These are all experiences. Um, and that costs a lot of money. And, you know, that you have nothing left with that except the memory which fades over time. Um, but Ferrari Testarossa, that has beauty, that has heritage, that has culture, that has flair, that has passion from a lot of people all put into that chunk of metal. That has the hopes and the dreams from when I was a kid. It has the, you know, all the hard work and the graft and the... the who I wanted to be and how I looked up to my dad, all in that hunk of metal. Um, So there's something quite spiritual in that. So I think it's very bad to be only having happiness from material items. That's the only way that you... um, Someone's just said they hope it will drive. drive. (laughs) Thanks for the the trolling. Um, So what does... What does a nice material item do? It gives you a feeling. Satisfaction. What does an experience do? It gives you a feeling. So it's the same thing. Now, I say this because I just don't think it's as binary as, you know, materialism is bad. Being a slave to material items and getting yourself in debt for the instant fix of feeling good about having a, a new shirt or, you know, a new, new dress that you can't afford and then being in debt. Yeah, that's a, a bad cycle to be in. Um, I think money does make you happy. It just doesn't make you fulfilled. And what makes you fulfilled is your relationships with people and what you get to give and how you get to help and the purpose and the meaning of your life. Money and material items and the experiences you get from that are an enabler of that. So knowing the difference between happiness and fulfillment, I think, is vital. Mm, That's really interesting. Yeah. And what a great place to finish. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Rob. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure, never a chore. (laughs) What did you just do? 
Which the fingers? Horns. It's the Which horns. fingers is that? It's the horns. <laughs> Don't worry. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks for listening. Thank you. You've been listening to Catherine Morgan's In Her Financial Shoes podcast. If you enjoyed this show, I'd love it if you could leave me a review on iTunes. And don't forget, if you're feeling stuck and overwhelmed and want to learn more about being financially resilient, confident and in control, head over to www.catherinemorgan.com. Hold up. 